Hello, I'm Aaron from 46 Solutions. Today we're going to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity is the latest in a, tr in a long line of words that basically just mean the, the practice of protecting your systems, keeping people out to protect the data that you keep in. Yeah, every business has a digital footprint. Uh, in, in today's day and age of computers and technology, we're storing employee information and customer information and vendor information and all types of data. We're banking electronically, we're paying our vendors, we're receiving payments, all of those things, the electronic methods. So cybersecurity is the defense of all of those things to make sure that you're protecting your business the best you can. Sounds like a really big concept. Does a small business need to worry about that? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, we all see the big stories of the big companies getting attacked, right? That's that's what gets the clicks, right, for, for the news agencies. But really, your probably largest victims from a scale standpoint are small businesses. Uh, the bad actors like to attack small businesses because they usually have the most simple defenses. Uh, it's easier to pick off the small guy than it is to go after the big one that has the expensive systems already in place. So I think, I think it's important for small businesses because every business is vulnerable. Um, I, say, I would say small businesses are even more vulnerable because oftentimes they don't have the assets to protect themselves in after the fact, right? So it's very easy for a small business to be bankrupted by a simple attack, whereas a large business might be able to pay out millions of dollars and continue surviving. But a small business, you know, they may not be able to make payroll. They may not be able to stay in business at all. Yeah, oftentimes when it comes to customer visits, these customers think, I'm not a target. I'm not big enough. I'm, I'm literally not a target or a Walmart, right? Hackers start from somewhere. They start from the ground up and they go after the small, medium businesses. And a lot of times, like he said, those small businesses where they just have home network solutions for their business, they're just using home routers. That's very basic protection. And a lot of times very little to no protection at all whatsoever. Because there's been times where I've walked into a business that we even have a Wi-Fi password. We, we read about a lot of these large data breaches in the media, but uh, do you think they're smaller ones? Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a, a lot more of the smaller ones than there are the ones we hear about um, from the big companies. The, the big companies have to report, typically, there's, they're under obligation to report the breach um, to their subscribers or to the public. The uh, smaller organizations, um, they're going to do everything they can in most cases to keep it out of the news, right? Because that's their reputation on the line. So um, for sure, the, the small businesses. And, and I think every small business owner or somebody who is the, the steward of that data should really be thinking in terms of, um, am I doing enough? What am I doing? If I had to answer those questions down the road, uh, would I feel comfortable with my answers about what I've done to protect that data? What are some of the types of employees that do this cybersecurity? Yeah, everyone, to be completely honest. The, the entire organization should be responsible for cybersecurity. Um, everyone from payroll clerks to receptionists that are answering the phones, uh, all the way up to the, the C-suite. Everyone should be concerned. To elaborate, Will, on what you said, you know, we, we are the weakest link in, in all of these cybersecurity systems. Almost every um, incident that we hear about in the news goes back to an individual and um, the security awareness training that you've done ahead of time um, to help mitigate that. Um, you know, it, most of the time it works, and and when it doesn't work, um, you've you've done everything at that point. Hopefully that you can, or you could have. If I'm a small business, is cybersecurity something you could do on your own, googling it and figuring it out? I mean, there's absolutely steps everyone can take on their own to protect themselves, but it is important to have subject matter experts, just like you would do with any other aspect of your business. Sometimes you need to bring experts in to have them evaluate things and help guide you and consult with you in the right direction to solve the problems that you may face and may not even be aware exist. Yeah, there's so many technologies out there that, that we're deploying these days. Um, it's almost exciting, you know, the, the defenses that we have available to us now versus even five years ago. And the overall cost of these tools has come down so significantly where you might have had to have had a big enterprise to afford something like a, a security information event monitoring system. Nowadays, um, we can provide those to small and medium businesses usually as part of a package that includes the anti-malware solution. So. 
the, the barrier to entry for these, these tools that, that used to be um, very expensive is now something that we can deploy in small and medium businesses, um, usually for the same cost as what people are typically paying for antivirus these days. They'll just take whatever is on their computer when they purchase it from Best Buy or Amazon, wherever they purchase it from, and then just let the antivirus expire. And that's where 46 Solutions comes in as a service and we offer what John Michael said, a security operations center, along with our antivirus in a package deal to where we can help protect your small, medium business at an affordable package. So you don't have to worry. Uh, you can have that peace of mind uh, you know, for your business. Yeah, it's, it's important because the threat landscape is constantly changing. Like, like John Michael said, there, there are constantly new things out there at all times. So it's important to have a team of people who are monitoring the current landscape and reacting to what's happening because you know every single day there is some new way of attacking or a new way of, of leveraging some new tool to take advantage of vulnerabilities uh, in systems so it's important to have you know not just an antivirus program but have one that's up to date right because an antivirus from last year does no good against the the new attacks so you need to have a, a modern system that's constantly being updated and monitored so it can change and grow with all of the things that are out there. And that's why we offer that security operations center type solution because nowadays just a antivirus and a malware programs aren't enough. Uh, they keep you protected for what's out there now, at least from what they know. But just like Will mentioned, you know, there's new ways coming up, you know, to penetrate a system all the time. It could be every five, 10 minutes and that's where you know, constantly 24 seven monitoring helps and comes into play. You mentioned Security Operations Center, what's that involve? So uh, part of the system that we deploy in most of our small and medium sized businesses includes uh, centralized uh, monitoring and reporting of all of the devices in your system and all of the log sources. Um, so in our, our Security Operations Center, um, of course, we have algorithms looking for correlations that might be interesting for our people to look into. Um, but we also have people actively threat hunting, looking for those existing things that they know about or investigating those um, interesting things that are showing up in the logs to help um, maybe track down something that's, that's new, um, something that a definition or a rule couldn't easily identify. And that, that's kind of what I was, was speaking to earlier, you know, the exciting tools av available today, um, that security inf information and event management system um, collects log data from all of the computers, uh, the switches, the firewall, um, any of the other um, telemetry data that comes in from the antivirus program. It goes out and checks um, uh, against all the known databases of malware. I and think the biggest value of, of a SIM, uh, you know, for for event monitoring and, and a SOC is that they're constantly looking for things. And you know you may have a couple of events that seem innocent on their own, but when you piece together these three or four innocent looking events, suddenly you have something much less innocent and sinister. And you may have someone who's starting to kind of probe things and see how far they can get in your systems. And if you're able to capture that early through a SIM or a security operations center, you can stop that person before they actually achieve their end goal. Well said. So uh, for instance, a business that's five plumbers, why would they have anything that they would need to worry about getting stolen? Yeah, that, I come into that all the time whenever visiting customers. And a lot of times when they hear someone like Will talking about a SIM and a SOC working together, most that, that plumber's gonna be like, what? I don't understand what you're saying. But what, when that comes into place, when those plumbers or anyone with a small business that has maybe five or 10 employees will think, we don't store anything, you know? We write, we're, we write it on a piece of paper. Well, they also, they, they have to put something somewhere because they take payments. Most people don't carry cash anymore. So, and they have customer information because a lot of times those plumbers, HVAC companies, they have a database because a lot of times they sell uh, a package, a yearly package where they basically send services every year, you know, twice a year sometimes just to help their customers. So they have a database. And even if it doesn't have credit card information or anything like that, they have personal identifiable information, PII, that the hacker will want. Because all they need is like, hey, here's a list of customers. Now they could go start working on some of those customers as well as continue working on that business. You have one person's social security number. They're 
One person's direct deposit information because most people get their paychecks directly deposited. Uh, one person's name, address, driver's license number. I mean, all of that is something worth stealing because that means that, that someone could steal that person's identity. So if you have one employee, even if it's yourself, you have something worth stealing. I mean, even if you even send an old school check, you still have to get that information from somewhere. Yeah. So, um, I mean, they, they will always have some sort of piece of information that hacker will want, no matter what the customer will say, as that small business owner will say, they, they, would, they do have something that the hackers want. So what vulnerabilities do, do you see out there for companies today? Phishing is one of them. A phishing examples could be sending a fake email trying to get that customer, that person to reset their password, click this bad link. Yeah, you touched on it. There's there's several different types of these phishing attacks. There's, um, you know, there's vishing, which is where they're calling you and trying to get information out of you and potentially get you to do something, get you to log into your bank and do something or get you to install some software on your computer so that they have access to it. There's smishing, which is they text you. You mentioned texting. Uh, uh, there's spear phishing. So spear phishing is a very targeted form of phishing in that they're no longer just sending out messages to hundreds of people hoping somebody clicks. Instead, they're, they're using LinkedIn and things like that and they're figuring out who your payroll clerks are or who your HR person is. And they're sending these emails about, hey, my direct deposit changed, send the money over here now uh, and those. And then the last form is, is a fairly new one that's called whaling. And, that's where they're using social media and all this information that's out there about businesses to find those, the whales, right? The, the C-level executives, the, the HR directors, those people that are high value targets, uh, as to put it simply. And, and they start specifically trying to attack those people or attack like the secretary that works for the CEO. Because if you can get into the secretary's account, oftentimes she has access to the CEO's email. Uh, so things like that are just all these new vectors that all play on the human factor um, uh, that, that Eric mentioned. So, Yeah, and so in a lot of cases, these phishing attempts, the social engineering is, is trying to get access to your data, your account password, that sort of thing. But in a lot of cases, we're seeing a lot recently where it's taking advantage of maybe a misconfiguration in a security level or a permission on a machine and allowing a user to install a package and and once the bad guys will call them you know get a foothold um, then they're going to try to take advantage of any number of things um, a, a big thing we see in almost every um, assessment we've done is work that could be done to improve the patch management program at an organization so you know the companies Microsoft for example is the easiest one to talk about they release patches you know constantly for Windows and you hear about them in the news all the time patch this, they've just released this thing, it's critical, it's, it's being exploited in the wild. And that just means that, that they know people have used that particular compromise to take advantage. And so um, the patch management system is, is critical. Uh, that, that's, that's one of the things that um, we, we like to um, take a hold of, both with the Microsoft patches and third-party patches. We have somebody always working on patches for one of our customers. 24-7, somebody's doing some patch work. Um, so just wanted to bring that up. I'm happy to be joined today with Brandon Miller, cyber security professional. How are you doing today, Brandon? Pretty good. How about yourself, Aaron? Not too bad. All right. How about you tell us a little bit about your cyber security background? Okay. Well, I actually started in the security industry in 1991 whenever I joined the U.S. Navy. Uh, for 20 years, I was a cryptologist, so I protected data. Uh, you know, either using proprietary systems or commercial off-the-shelf systems. I retired in 2011, and at that point, I went to work in the healthcare industry. Um, and since that time, I've pretty much focused on compliance and standards. How have you seen through those years of experience? Obviously, that's 20 plus years. Obviously, computer networks, cybersecurity has changed. H how have you seen that change and develop through those years? I'd say the biggest thing is, in the beginning, hackers were experts at their trade. Uh, they had a lot of experience in programming and uh, things of that nature. And in today's environment, that knowledge base is transferred down. Uh, what I mean by that is, there's tools readily available that anybody can use. A lot of these tools are on the internet. And some of these tools are considered projects that universities are doing. And by nature of being a university, they have to share that data with, with everyone. 
So what will happen is people with very little hacking experience can become hackers overnight just by using these tools. Do you think the technology itself that's developed over the last 20 years, it, that in and of itself creates a vulnerability? Yeah, it's uh, the more and more complex that these systems get, uh, whether they be operating systems or tools, the harder it is to keep those systems secure. A really good example of this is a couple of years ago, whenever the health exchange uh, stood up for federal health care, uh, there were hundreds of vulnerabilities discovered just in a 24 hour period whenever they released that code. So what happens is a lot of our software these days actually have more lines of code than a fighter jet. And that just blows my mind that people think that that can be easily secured. What do you see as the uh, impact of some of these breaches that you've experienced over the years? I'd say the biggest impact would have to be reputational damage. So a lot of small firms don't have a lot, you know, a lot of money, cash money on hand. Um, and as a business, it really hurts them if their reputation is damaged. So they don't have that big marketing team that can help them get over these uh, breach notifications and the public interest of a breach. So I do see a lot of small companies fail because they do have breaches. In your experience, are, is there a lot of underreporting of breaches? Absolutely. Um, based on that reputational damage, a lot of smaller or mid-sized companies don't want to get that information out. And a lot of times they're notified by law enforcement. They don't even know that they've been breached. And what they'll do is they will typically not notify their clients that they've even been breached because of that reputational damage. How about compliance? You, you mentioned that uh, in your background. How, how does that play into this? Yeah, so there's a lot of compliance, whether it be uh, regulations, so federal law, or industry compliance requirements, such as uh, the payment card industry. So PCI, or the payment card industry, requires that if you accept credit cards as form of payment, that you do an annual review uh, of your technology systems, your people, and your processes. And what I see is a lot of the smaller businesses rely on their vendors to provide that security for them, and they don't even know what they're responsible for whenever it comes to that type of, of assessment. So some of this is contractually required by vendors and contractors? Yeah, I've actually seen companies have their ability to use credit card as, form of, uh, as a form of payment be removed. So they, they have to go back either to a cash payment system or an electronic payment system for a period of time. And sometimes they actually suffer fines from the credit card industry itself. How about financial liabilities? Yeah, so a lot of companies are actually held liable for breaches. And usually that comes in a monetary form. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I've seen at times, if you uh, accept credit cards and you are breached, uh, the banks will actually uh, fine you. And I've seen some of those fines, uh, you know, as small as $30,000, which for a smaller medium business, that's a lot of money, all the way up to millions of dollars. In your experience, what are, what are some things that a small business, say right here in Lexington, can do to, to protect themselves? Number one, uh, I want to point out your brand, your technology partner. So if you don't have security experience, it is very important to actually partner with someone who does. You can go it alone, but a lot of times that leads to failure. And um, one of the things we usually say is there's two types of companies out there. Companies that have, have, have had breaches or companies that have had breaches and just don't know it yet. So I think it's truly important to partner with a company that can actually understand your business, not get in the way of your business, and actually provide you with that service that you need, the security service. Everybody knows about it takes a village to raise a child, but what they don't realize is it also takes a village to secure your data. So very few companies can go it alone. Even some of the larger companies that we see you know, online or, or in the news every day, they outsource a lot of their IT security. So people don't realize that it's so large and so difficult of an issue that you need help. It's something that we see on a constant basis when we go to evaluate a small business here, even in the Lexington market. They either say, we don't have anything to steal or 
they got a guy and it's maybe they're one person in the office and it, it, it seems like they're not truly prepared. They don't have that education or that experience in handling that depth of, of what you're discussing. It seems like there's a big analytical component of this. Absolutely. One of my first clients was actually a very large paint manufacturer. And as a new consultant, uh, I went to that client and I began, I assumed originally that their, you know, their competitive advantage would be their formula for their paint. And whenever I started my line of questioning, one of the first things that they told me was, we don't care about paint, that's chemistry. We, pair, we care about our employees and we especially care about our customers. So it's really surprising having 20 plus years of experience in security, I failed to understand what it is that the business deemed important. So if you have a good partner that can ask those questions and get to the root of your business, then that's the kind of relationship that you want in a security company. It was great discussing cybersecurity with you today, Brandon. Thanks for stopping by, I really appreciate it. Anytime. It, it sounds like there's a lot of vulnerabilities out there. How does a how does a small business prepare for the aftermath of one of these attacks? I think the most important thing is to have a plan. Um, simple as that is that you need to plan for what's going to happen before it happens. Because if you wait till it happens, then you're not prepared and you're not going to make the right decisions. If you have a plan in place and you have a series of steps, then when that breach happens, everybody knows what they need to do. And you can take those steps and you can mitigate it as quickly and as, mo as effectively as possible. So I think, I think it's important to assume you've been breached and, and play that out. So, you know, work with a team like, like someone like John Michael and bring them in and say, okay, let's say your payroll system got breached today. What are you going to do? And you develop a plan of action. And that's the most important thing you can do because no one wants to be sitting there with the FBI or, or some other federal agency sitting across the table saying, you got hacked and we found your stuff. And what are you, good, what are you doing about it? And you're just like, I don't know. I think that was very, very well said, Will. And, and that's a good thing for anybody um, watching this today is just ask yourself, what, what is my plan? You know, if you don't already have a document drawn up, your incident response program, you know, that talks about literally who's, who you're gonna call, what they're gonna do, maybe you've got a whole stack of instructions for each person involved in the response plan. If you don't have that, that's a great place to start. Yeah. And this all boils back down to being proactive. And like Will said, John Michael reiterated, having a plan, you know, worst case scenario, you have a backup, you can go to that backup. Do you test the backup? Do you have the plan for your backup? And proactive is just, it always comes up. It's an overarching theme. So if a, if a small business is ready to take cybersecurity seriously, what are the, what are the steps? What's the process? Well, um, give, give us a call and, um, and we can talk. An initial phone call will um, get an idea of the maturity level of your existing program. Um, we'd like to do an assessment um, and that can be a very brief, um, you know, it's not gonna take a lot of your time. Think, think in terms of 30 minutes or so. Um, and from there, we can come up with a, a basic plan of action and, and establish um, a good starting point for your program. So what's the one takeaway that the audience should have today? I think, I think it's important for everyone to understand that as, as an organization, to defend yourself, you have to be right every single time. You, you can't let your guard down one time because all it takes is one time. A cyber criminal only has to get it right once and they can breach you. So it's important to, to be proactive, to contact somebody, to make a plan and have that plan in place. And then not just uh, make a plan, but take action on it. it, it you know. Knowing what your vulnerabilities are is not enough. You also have to then fill those gaps, close those vulnerabilities, and, and do so in a way that protects your company, protects your people, and protects your customers. Well, thank you for your time today. If you'd like to learn more about cybersecurity, contact 46Solutions at 46solutions.com.